Hi, this is John Shields, and uh, we're talking about um, <clears throat> Blue Velvet. This is the second lecture for the class uh, COM 2202 film history. And <clears throat> I want to discuss Blue Velvet uh, as a substitute for discussing our lecture and discussion day that we can't have because of the calendar at NCC. So Blue Velvet was a very strange film. Um, probably something that most of my students are not, uh, have not had um, contact with a kind of film like that before. I do understand it is uh, 30 some years ago, but it's, uh, it's a really powerful film in many ways. And in this 30 minute lecture or so, I'd like to discuss the idea about how the film works in conjunction with uh, a kind of Freudian uh, analysis, okay? Because obviously the film is uh, very psychological. So just so you have a sense, we'll, we'll get to the idea of the elements of filmmaking because it's a very rich film in terms of its mise-en-scene qualities. Um, as the reading points out, the film has a kind of painterly sensibility even though it's a bit disturbing, it's beautifully pulled off, um, I think, in terms of its overall vibe. And I want to discuss how the film corresponds with pretty basic elements of psychology. Now, I'm hardly an authority on psychoanalysis or Sigmund Freud. So what I'm about to discuss is pretty basic level idea of Freudianism, in which some of you who have had me from Mass Communications 101, we've done that before. <clears throat> so Sigmund Freud is considered the father of psychoanalysis. He was writing about psychology 125 years ago or so, late, late 1800s, early part of the 20th century. He was from Austria, and he was German, and he was someone who was very, very, very influential. And Freud talked about the theory of the subconscious mind, the things that we keep in the back of our mind and how they reveal themselves in regular day life. Okay. So um, what I want to discuss is this idea of Freud's theory of the subconscious mind. But first, I want to talk just about regular basic ideas of consciousness, right? Okay, so just, just discussing this. We're all aware of what consciousness means. We're conscious meaning that we're awake in the world and we have the ability to think and we have the ability to be conscious, okay? We're all living human organisms on the planet Earth. We were all born of a mother and supported by that mother and father. And we go from being infants to babies, to toddlers, to children, to teenagers to adults. And we have the ability to learn and to think and to discern and make choices and understand things. And then we're just these regular people, these regular walking around people. And when we're awake, we're consciously aware of things and we say things and we do things. Just regular old consciousness, you know? Then we go to sleep. And if we're lucky enough, we sleep very well and have a very deep sleep. And then each one of us has dreams in our deep sleep. And you can always tell someone when they're dreaming, if they're asleep and they have what's called rapid eye movement and their eyes are moving, even though they're closed, it means that they're dreaming of something. Now, everybody has dreams, 
And everybody has dreams that they can't explain. Everybody has dreams that are strange and we're the star of our own dreams. And we do things in dreams that are weird and odd and sometimes dangerous or bizarre. And I don't mean just sexuality. Um, I mean, certainly human beings dream frequently about sex and sexuality. But often we dream, you know, things that are disturbing or bizarre or strange, or we act terrible, or we commit horrible things in dreams. Then most of us just wake up and kind of shake our heads and be like, yeah, I had a weird dream last night, whatever, right? What Freud was trying to get at is, what do those dreams mean? Why do we have them? There are dreams, right? You know, if I have a weird dream about doing something terrible, it's on me. It's in the back of my mind that when I'm walking around in regular life, I'm just a decent human being who's reasonably nice and talking to people. And then if I go to sleep and have a dream that's really bizarre, and crazy, where did that come from? For Freud, he, he talked about this at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century as this idea that we repress our thoughts and our desires in regular life. But they've got to come out somehow. So they come out in dreams, right? They come out in our subconscious. So our conscious level is here on the level, on the surface level. And then beneath or in the back of our mind is what you call the subconsciousness, right? Those things that we dream about, okay? Let me give you a kind of a stupid example that I've given my students over the years. When I'm teaching my classes, I ask my students to make sure they read the textbook or do the readings because it's important that they read, read the textbook and read, do the readings because they'll have a better sense of what's going to be talked about in class. And the students say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do the reading shields. I'll do the readings. And consciously, I'm in class going, OK, you're going to do the readings. Yeah, OK, good. And then I find out that they really don't do the readings. They don't care. And they don't do the readings. And it makes me upset. It makes me upset, but consciously in the present time, I'll say, come on now, you got to do the readings, okay? And I'm repressing maybe my anger or my disappointment. I'm repressing it and I'm just being consciously saying, come on, you got to do the readings, okay? Even if it's hard, do it, okay? Oh, sure, sure, I'll do the readings. I'll, I'll do it, okay. And I'm just a human being. I come home, I have dinner with my wife and my child, and I talk about the day, and I was like, ah, yeah, I can tell my students aren't doing the readings. And then I go to sleep at night, and I have a really, really, really deep sleep. And in that sleep, <laughs> I have a dream. And maybe in that dream, I'm stabbing some of my students in the throat with a fork because they're not doing the readings. Right? Now, of course, that doesn't happen. right? But what I mean is, Freud would say, that part of me is so angry that my students aren't doing the readings, but in class I can't yell like a crazy person. So I sort of repress that feeling of anger or disappointment, but it's gotta go somewhere. So it goes in the back of my mind. So when I dream, I dream of my anger being demonstrated somehow. So in a very basic level, that's what Freud is saying. He's saying consciously when we're walking around in our everyday life, we're repressing a lot of our feelings because society demands that we repress them, okay? Fair enough, okay? And what he called, he gave names to these parts of our subconsciousness. <clears throat> One of them he called the id, or id, id. And the id is the part of all of us that represents all our desires. It's the things that we want and the action and feeling of wanting something, whatever it is. It's somewhat the selfish part of our subconsciousness. And when I say desires here, I don't mean sexual desires or just sexual desires, but sexual desires is part of it. But it's just desires for selfishness, for what we want. And all of us have it, right? We all have an id. The opposite of the id is called the superego. The superego is the part of us that says, maybe we shouldn't be so selfish. Maybe we should sort of temper our desires that the it is telling us. Maybe she, we shouldn't be so difficult or selfish or interested in just feeding our own egos or feeding our own sensibilities. And the balance between those two opposing forces 
is the ego. The ego is, for Freud, the difference between the id on one level, asking for getting stuff, and the superego from being more moderate and temperate. If you'd like to put it in Judeo-Christian terminology, the id is the devil on your soldier saying, yeah, get it, take it, give, get what you want all the time, be selfish. And the superego, the superego is the angel on your shoulder saying, no, you shouldn't be that selfish. You have to think of other people. You shouldn't be such a jerk all the time. And the ego is the, is the balance between those two things. And for Freud, he was saying that most people's egos are dependent upon whether or not they have a kind of balance between those two things. And if you have a 50-50 balance between being reasonable and not so selfish and caring about other people, your super ego is 50%. And if you, you know, have goals and desires and needs and wants, which everybody does, that's the other 50%, angel and devil, right? And that the ego is the combination of those two things. So in basic Freudian analysis, that's the idea of subconsciousness. But the key thing with Freudian stuff is that it's in the back of one's mind. It's below the surface, right? And a lot of times we don't even know that we're in touch with it because we're busy just living our conscious lives, right? Subconsciously, we do things all the time without re realizing what we're doing. So that's a basic idea of subconsciousness. You have consciousness, which means you're awake and aware and just being a person. And subconsciousness are the things that are tapped inside your back of your mind that are revealed often in dreams or almost without you being aware of it. Now, how this connects <clears throat> to Blue Velvet is that Blue Velvet is very much a film that is what's referred to as surrealistic. Right from the beginning of the film, you are given a slow pan, I'm sorry, <clears throat> a slow tilt down of redder than red roses set up against a bluer than blue sky, against a whiter than whiter picket fence, with this old-fashioned, early 60s, sweet, naive song called Blue Velvet. And you see these fire truck guys waving at the camera in slow motion. You see this Americana, this sort of semi-80s, 60s, 50s, white suburban era. You're not even sure which era it is. It's very strange. And children crossing the street, white children primarily. I think there's one black kid in there. And it's very much a kind of almost you don't trust how weird this normal and bland suburban landscape is being introduced to you. Right away, it's it's surreal. It's realer than real, right? Um, and Lynch, the whole time, is showing us the kind of depth between the surface level of reality to what is beneath that level of reality. So the, the initial shots are of this landscape of white suburbia, of essentially post-World War II America, really any time from the sort of late 50s to the 80s. It's what it looks like. With mothers watching a television show, with a kid and a little dog, and everything's very sweet until... The father has a stroke, and it's foreshadowed with the coil of the um, um, hose coiling up to sort of represent the coiling up of his inner, I don't know, his veins or whatever happens to him in his nerves, and he has a stroke. And then the camera goes right along the ground and has close-ups of ants devouring each other to demonstrate that you have this upper surface level reality and below the surface level reality that's much darker and much more sinister and much more ugly. And those two things are existing all the time. And throughout the rest of the film, our hero, Jeffrey, 
who's a product of this surface level suburban reality, finds the ear, can't help himself, tries to find out about what's going on in his community, under uh, uh, comes to discover a complete underground world of criminals and perverts and weirdos, and it's frightening, and it's all happening within the same town. And he further finds himself voyeuristically turned on by Dorothy Valens. And when she asks him to hit her while they engage in sexual escapades, he finds himself turning in, getting turned on by this sexually. He's going from being a naive teenager to a young man. And all of that is shot in a weird, disturbing, dark, bizarre way with noises and sounds and fire and all of that stuff is supposed to represent the difference between consciousness and the suburban reality that seems nice and perfect and subconsciousness, the darkness that's in everybody's head that Jeffrey now is sort of getting into and finding literally an underground society in this, you know, basic suburban world. Consciousness and subconsciousness at the same time, okay? That's essentially what Lynch is doing with this movie. He's tapping into subconscious desires by showing what lies beneath the suburban safety and sanctity of Lumberton. It's very, very psychological, okay? In terms of the stuff that's in your reading, the reading is a good reading in terms of its charting of David Lynch his own history, where he comes from, how he was kind of an army brat, how he went around the whole country as a young person. Not the whole country, but his family moved around quite a bit. And how he made some very, very strange films beforehand. Okay. On page 69, on the right-hand side, I have some markings for you to, 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 to take a look at. The tantalizing ear represents a seashell. When the camera enters its dark aperture, it reveals, a, it reveals a rare view of the crevices around the hole. Jeffrey launches an investigation that leads him beneath Lumberton's placid surface into an underworld of sleazy drug dealers and corrupt cops. Okay, so that's what I was just saying before. Jeffrey is assisted by Sandy Laura Dern, a high school senior whose detective father is also investigating the mystery. As a comic book character, Sandy is all wholesome Betty to Jeffrey's morally ambiguous Archie. Jeffrey's sleuthing leads him to Dorothy Valens, Isabella Rosalini, a nightclub chanteuse and sexual slave of Frank Booth, Dennis Hopper, who has kidnapped her and her son and her husband and cut off the latter's ear. Then they talk about Blue Velvet, the actual song. The song is supposed to represent an innocent time from the early 60s, but used in this film, it's almost like a joke. It's almost like you can't trust the idea of Blue Velvet. It's almost like it's being used completely ironically, completely against the normal, sweet version of it, okay? Um, It would be like kind of using, I don't know, a sweet song that you grew up with in a Disney film, like Akuna Matata or something like that. And suddenly Akuna Matata was being used in some sort of pervy movie about, you know, suburban underground, you know, sex uh, uh, camps or something. And if, you know, um, if you heard that and saw it at the same time, your generation would understand, oh, they're using Akuna Matata in a completely different way. Well, that's how Blue Velvet was used in the early 60s. It was used in a very sweet way, like, she wore Blue Velvet and I loved her, blah, blah, blah. But now it's like, oh, my God, Blue Velvet and, like, the group of people with Frank Booth and their coated paints and candy-colored clowns and and he, all the weird stuff that he does. Like, it's disturbing, okay? It's used ironically, opposite of what's normal intention. <clears throat> He talks really nicely at the bottom of page 69. A bright red fire engine with its smiling fireman moves slowly down the street. The sequence has a dreamy, surrealistic quality with yellow tulips swaying in a warm afternoon breeze. The camera suddenly cuts to the ground level of grass and ominous sounds as well 
Black insects crawl in the darkness. The powerful image sets the film's tone, announcing the duality of beautiful surfaces and horrible things beneath. Now, that's pretty easy to understand, right? You have good and evil, you have consciousness and subconsciousness, and you have this duality of these things existing at the same time. <clears throat> On page 70, I have it marked off for you in parentheses. Jeffrey lives in, the, in a mythic present that feels like the past. Although the setting is contemporary, and when I say contemporary, I mean it's 1986. Lynch fills every frame with signifiers, household furnishings, cars, and even sounds that evoke the past 40 years of American pop culture. Again, at the time of this writing, um, 40 years was from the 90s to the 50s. Blending the real and the surreal, Lynch uh, merges melodrama, comedy, and noir with both naivete and pulp kinkiness. Indeed, viewers had no idea whether the film was supposed to be funny or malignant, naive or knowing, emphatic or inhuman. The answer is, of course, all of the above. In some ways, I think that's what this film does. Even now, even 30 some years later, the film puts viewers in a kind of fascinated yet uncomfortable position because we're not exactly sure what's going on here. We don't know who the hero is. We think it's going to be Jeffrey, but we see him, you know, dealing with Dorothy in a very disturbing way. And he's like not altogether disliking it. And we see that good triumphs over evil. And we see that there is a certain return to normalcy. But I think the viewer is left thinking, hmm, that's not to be trusted. The movie in some ways presents innocence and then how innocence gets lost. It presents the idea of America with the idea of America having a dirty underground to it. It presents the idea of suburbia as this perfect place, but it's imperfect by its very opposite the disturbing, corrupt people who also make up part of America slash suburbia, okay? It's a beautifully um, made film in a lot of ways. Also on page 70, Lynch's hypnotic style is achieved not by means of gliding camera or sharp editing, but with painterly vision and composition. So disquieting and artfully composed are Lynch's images that when Jeffrey discovers two corpses, one still standing, the other bound to a chair, the vision is arresting in the manner of Dwayne Hansen or Eric Kleinhold's lifelike figural sculptures. Sensuous details blend with painterly neo-Gothic style of the bizarre. Almost everything is the opposite of what it seems. Neat, placid surfaces cloak macabre reality, and the outwardly horrible is ultimately the most benign. Malignant impulses fester deep within people and things. Lynch creates a hallucinatory atmosphere, unfolding the story with the logic of a nightmare. The surreal texture gives the audience pause, wondering where the dream ends and the temporal world begins. So I think that's very good writing on page 70, on the top of page 70. It's beneath where I've marked it off for you. The film in some ways is like a dream. It's like a bad dream. Remember I was talking about Freud saying that our subconsciousness comes out in dreams. And what he's saying, what Freud is saying is that we repress our feelings, but they come out sometimes in dreams. And what Lynch is doing is he's applying, if not Freudian analysis, at least psychological analysis to this idea. That America, suburbia, Jeffrey, people all have two sides to them. And the way in which Lynch uses his elements of filmmaking is he shows almost a surreal quality of a beauty, of a majestic beauty of the suburbs cut against the darkness, cut against ants eating each other, cut against Frank Booth doing those awful things with the nitrous oxide and saying those weird stuff and it's all in darkness with shafts of light, okay? It's to represent the darker aspects of human nature, the darker aspects of the human condition and the duality between the id and the superego, okay? <clears throat> Over on page 71, unlike most small town films in which attitude towards sex is hygienic or hypocritical, Blue Velvet depicts sex as an act of risk and adventurism. 
Huge flames and roaring sounds highlight the lovemaking. The linking of desire and fire is a recurrent motif in Lynch's work. The rites of passage in his coming-age film go way beyond Norman and Allison, Innocent Kiss, and Peyton Place. Uh, the younger people in here would not know what Peyton Place is. I guess it would be like saying something like, um, this goes way beyond iCarly or some <laughs> Disney show or something, right? Um, where you know they go on dates and hold hands. This is way beyond that sense of innocence. Um, the film is very, very powerful. And the elements of filmmaking that I think make, make it most powerful are the dark cinematography, the, the sounds, the sound effects and noises. There's like this low, awful hum that happens whenever Frank is around. It doesn't even make sense in the story. It's just there. The, the things with fire that pop up out of nowhere. That, that It's not logical, right? It's just there as a sort of aesthetic choice to emphasize the surrealism of it, not the realism of it. Okay. The acting style is exaggerated. The script is exaggerated because it's tapping into people's subconscious feelings. And even the realistic stuff is so weird that it almost doesn't feel real. It feels like oddly performed real instead of just natural real. Right. The whole film has this sort of strange balance between good and evil, between dark and light, between id and superego, between consciousness and subconsciousness. That's really what the, the film is about in a lot of ways. And it's, you know, sad and has some, you know, a decent ending. And But it's ultimately saying that as we go from innocence, from children, we lose our innocence as adults in the adult world. And we sometimes repress that sense of loss of innocence in our subconsciousness. Besides this 30 minute little lecture here, I will also send you a link to another uh, YouTube channel that discusses the film along these lines. Um, I think it's about eight minutes long or so. You can you know, watch it certainly. Um, and then we'll go over it a little bit before we see next week's film, okay? Uh, again, um, I hope that between this and the 30 minute lecture I had given to the God, I, I had for the Godfather, that you'll find this interesting and appealing. And I hope to not have to use this again. Um, and uh, I will see you next Tuesday, the 14th, for I think it's Boys Don't Cry, which is an outstanding film. And I can't even believe it's as old as it is. Uh, we're moving along quickly. Do try to pre register for classes for the spring semester. And I shall see you guys next Tuesday. Thanks for listening in and all the best. Bye-bye.